Hi, I'm Ed Thomas. I am the preaching lead pastor, teaching pastor at Spirit of Joy. And I want to talk to you today about God's vision for the church. Not just for our church, although our church hopes to follow God's vision for the church, of course. But I want to talk about God's vision for the church. If you want to understand this, you need to understand the timeline. Jesus came down to earth. He ministered. He taught. He healed. He did miracles. He, there were signs that pointed people to him. And yet the world basically rejected him. And he was crucified. He was crucified, and we know this now, for our sins, to forgive us. But after he was crucified, he rose from the dead. It was the proof that he needed in order to get the disciples that he had mentored for three years to move forward and follow that great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now the cool part of that was it was 40 days after Jesus' resurrection that Jesus gave that commission and ascended into heaven. And he told them to go. <laughs> and what did they do for, for, four, or for the next 10 days? They didn't go. They sat. They prayed, but they sat. They didn't know how to do this. There was no great power within them to do this. This was on their own steam. But then suddenly, on that 10th day, the 50th day after the resurrection, the day of Pentecost, suddenly it said there was a sound like the rush of a violent wind and the Holy Spirit descended upon them. And suddenly everything changed in the entire world. The disciples went out. They began to speak in other languages. Jerusalem that day, it was a festival day. And people from all over were there speaking many languages. And they were able to talk to them and they would hear in their own languages. Peter stood up that day. Fifty days after Jesus was crucified, Peter stood up and preached a message that essentially was poking his finger in the face of people, saying, this Jesus whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. It says that day, the people were cut to the heart. The Spirit was there. The Spirit was moving. They were cut to the heart. And 3,000 people that day joined the church. And I want to read to you from the end of Acts, chapter 2, what it says happened as they did this. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said, what should we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. That's the first step in faith for everyone. And it says that day, 3,000 people were added to the faith. And verse 42, they devoted themselves to four things. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Now take a look at that because those are a model for how a church should be shaped. We should devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. And where do we find the apostles' teaching? The teachings of John and Matthew and Peter and all the other apostles, we find them in God's Word. If we want to do what the earliest church did, what that model was from the very beginning, the first thing we must do is, as a congregation, devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. And the second thing they devoted themselves to was to fellowship. Now, we have kind of a deflated view of fellowship. Fellowship for many people means food. It means getting together. Fellowship is so much richer than that. 
Fellowship is lives lived together. It is church as family. That's my vision of, of part of what the church should be. I remember moving from Virginia to North Carolina when I was about 10 years old. We moved farther away from family as my father's career took him to a new site. And as we did that, the church became aunts and uncles for me. My friends became my cousins. And I loved that church. They gave me the privilege of going back and preaching just a few years ago. Some of the old stalwarts were there in the church. They seemed a hundred years old at the time. Thirty years later, they were literally turning 95, two of them in the same week. They were like aunts and uncles of mine. Fellowship. It's church as family. They devoted themselves to the breaking of the bread. It's that sacramental sense as, as we gather before the altar again and again and again to come and Christ has promised through this meal to be present among us. Through this meal there is the forgiveness of sins. Through this meal community we are stitched together more tightly as communion. We look backward in remembrance and, and think about all that he's done for us and we look forward to that feast that is to come. This is a sacred meal and that's what they devoted themselves to. And then to prayers. Prayers, it's, it's prayers for our own needs. It's prayers for our friends. It's prayers for God's presence to live within the kingdom. It's God's pres it's prayers that forge that relationship between us and God. It is a communication that we have with our Lord. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayers, and awe came upon everyone. I love that sense. Why do we not have as much awe as we could in our world? It's because we're not devoting ourselves. We're not seeing God in Scripture. We're not praying for one another. We haven't crafted a family, and we live in a generation where we're all moving away from people, and we're getting more isolated by technology, and we need that fellowship. We need to come to God's altar. That's how awe comes upon everyone. It goes on and says, Many signs and wonders were being done by the apostles. That sense of, do we look expectantly to God in order to see what he has done? Do we believe that God is alive and active in our world? It said all who believed were together and they held all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds as all to as any had need. They were generous. They lived generous lives. They saw the needs of people around them. In spirit of joy, the way we try and accomplish that, did you know that 25% of all that we take in and all that we do, directly or indirectly, goes outside the walls of our congregation to help non-members, 25% to help with needs, to help with all kinds of things. 25% then takes care of our own people, our own family, their needs, their concerns. And so as we look at what we do, it's that sense of generosity. It is our living our lives for others. It says day by day as they spent much time together in the temple. And I like that. I've heard recently that the average Christian comes to church nowadays, the average committed Christian comes 1.8 times per month. And to me, that just breaks my heart. We've said that the world is so busy, and it is, and it's crazy, and it's swallowing us. But as they spent time day by day in the temple, as church was a priority, as the Apostles' teaching and that fellowship was a priority. 
That's when awe came upon everyone. It says, as they did that, as they spent much time in the temple, they began to break bread at home. It was what they saw here begin to transform their family life. And their family life began to make them more hunger because church now wasn't just a thing we did in a building. Its faith was what happened at home. And that led them back to the building. And what they did in the building and with that fellowship transferred then to the home. And faith was everywhere. And soon they were praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And I like to ask this question. If a church, and not just a church, if the people in any church did this day by day by day by day, one, wouldn't there be more awe? And two, wouldn't the Lord be continually adding to those who were being saved? Thanks for tuning in to another video.